that kind of mandate has continually come back to me. And as it turned out, his words were prophetic in a way. Um, not to claim that I've invented the Carolina School of Bonsai, I would never call it that, for one thing. But the Arboretum's collection has become known now as, for many people, this is the way that they frame it. They say, well, they do a lot of work with native plants there, which is true. Right? Both of these are native plants. This is common red maple, grows all over the place, right? You can have as many of these as you want. All you have to do is find a big one, and there'll be lots of little ones in the immediate area. This is American elm. Not so easy to find anymore. It used to be a very, very common tree in America. But wiped out by an introduced pathogen, Dutch elm disease. But these are American elms. And as bonsai, you can control that fungal problem. <coughs> you know, a 60-foot tree, 75-foot tree, very difficult to deal with a fungal problem. But at this level, they're completely uh, dependable, right? So native plant material, we do that, and people have kind of hung our uh, identity on that hook. Oh yeah, that's the, the one that has all the native plant material. We do, but we also have all the other kinds of things like you'd expect, Japanese black pine, Japanese white pine, trident maples, Japanese maples, Chinese elms, duarias, all the traditional things, we have them too. But the thing is that a lot of our trees don't look the way that people think of bonsai looking. You know, we all walk around with our own images of, of everything, of everything, right? It's like an essence of, right? So if I say dog, you can all conjure up mentally an image of a dog. Maybe it's a dog you own. Maybe it's a dog that bit you when you were a kid. Maybe it's a dog that you saw in a movie one time. But you all have some image in your mind of dog. And it could be better informed or lesser informed. You all also have an image of bonsai in your mind. When somebody says bonsai, whether you're conscious of it or not, you're visualizing that thing. What do you see? Right? And for the, the average person in the public, their response would be like mine was the first time I was asked by the boss. When he was going to give me this job, he said, do you know what bonsai are? And I said, yeah, those are those strange little Japanese trees. And he said, that's right. That's how most people think of bonsai. Not necessarily you, because you've all stepped past that point, right? You're interested enough to come out and take part in this organization and learn more and study and go see shows and all the rest of it. But for the average person out there, you say bonsai, that's what they think. They think those little Japanese trees in the fancy pots. You know what happens when people think that first? A big, big, big chunk of the potential audience goes... Because they know they don't want that. They don't really actually know what it is, but they know they don't want that. that was, I was in a similar kind of position myself. Because when the job was offered to me the first time, I refused it. How would you like to be responsible for those trees? Yeah, not, not very much. <laughs> Seriously, that was my response. And it was only when the boss did a little arm twisting and said, well, you know, it might be a career opportunity. And I was thinking, yeah, a career opportunity, right? And little trees, my future. I didn't think that was very inviting. But, you know, as a practical matter, when your boss starts talking to you about career opportunities, you better be paying attention. So I said, yeah, I would do it. And I said, but I'd like to just do it like in my free time, because I like what I'm doing now, and I'd like to keep doing that. And he said, no problem. Because neither one of us knew what we were talking about. Right? <laughs> Little Japanese trees, how big a deal could it be? <laughs> All right, so I go to Mr. Yoshimura to learn how, and instead he fills my head with this kind of nonsense. And down the line, it starts to fall into place and make sense to me as I go out and engage more bonsai, see more bonsai, and what do I see? I come to clubs like this and listen to the talk of the members and it all is referencing Japan. Go to a bonsai 
show what you see. You see trees set up in a way that imitates the Japanese tokenoma displays. Go to a bonsai shop, you know, if you could find one. Go to a bonsai shop, you walk in, what do you see? You see scrolls for sale, you see all this kind of uh, Asian accoutrement that you can buy to take home with your bonsai so that you got the official stuff that you need to do it, right? And then I meet bonsai people like Felton Jones, great member of this club, right? Maybe founding member of this club? Sure. Okay, he was, he was bonsai pioneer in the southeast, Felton Jones, and he was completely that way. He, you know, he just about worshipped Japanese culture, in my memory of it. It was all exquisite, refined. You had to spend your life studying it just so you could get the smallest little bit of understanding of it, you know? And the same way with bonsai. You, you know, 20, 30 years, you might just be cracking the egg a little bit, you know? And if you stick with it, you'll get there one day in some life down the line. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's fine. There are many people for whom all that is wonderful. They love that. They love it. And they love bonsai, and they enjoy it, and they share their love with other people who are interested. But again, that represents a really thin slice of the pie. If you're talking about the pie of public interest, right, which has something of relevance to me in my work, if I do bonsai in a way that the public doesn't engage with, how long will I have a job? Mm -hmm. Mr. Yoshimura recognized that, you know, before I did, long before I did. I just felt like, yeah, well, there's apparently an audience for this. You do it and they'll come. But that's not true. When you look around at other bonsai collections, public collections in the country, there you can count on the fingers of one hand how many of them do as well as the exhibit in Nashville, right? Many of the bonsai public collections are not strong. They're not a strong component of the garden that houses them because it's a specialty thing, right? It's this little demographic over here, the people who really and truly love Japanese culture. They're great people, great culture. There's nothing wrong with any of that, but that's not where most people are at. They picture that little funny triangular shaped Japanese tree in the fancy pot and it's like, yeah, those are fine, you know. I saw a guy selling them off the side of the highway. And that's the level of engagement you get. And then they're on to something else. My job, to make bonsai something that ordinary people would find interesting. How do you do that? Well, I asked myself that for years. I didn't do that. No. Meanwhile, it's learning how to make the little triangular-shaped Japanese trees, right? Because you've got to do that first, got to figure that out. So while working on that, always in the back of my mind, this idea about how do you make bonsai more engaging for everyday people? People who are not inclined that way to begin with, people who are not fascinated with uh, exotic culture, how do you make bonsai interesting to them? And it turned out the answer was really, really simple. Really simple. You redirect what the focus is away from the fascination with a foreign culture and toward what bonsai truly represents, which is nature, personal experience of nature. Everybody has that. Everybody. Now, there are people who live in penthouses in places that you and I would never want to live in, who don't see trees on a regular basis, who think of them as foreign objects, you know, but for most of us, trees and nature in general is an everyday and very welcome, even necessary part of our life, right? When you get stressed, oh, you know, let's go take a walk in the woods, let's go to the park, let's do something that puts us back out there and reconnects us with the natural world, because most of us have a very positive response to that. It rejuvenates us. It always has. Every art form you can think of traces its roots back to the human experience of nature. Everyone. Dance, music, sculpture, poetry. All of them. Where did their beginnings come? Came from the feeling that we get 
being in the natural world, experiencing it, trying to communicate some of that. One of the oldest known paintings in the world, they're those paintings of animals on the walls of the caves in France, right? By our, our Neanderthal, I shouldn't say that because I don't know Neanderthals live them, but our long ago ancestors, even them, who had to live in fear of those things, that was still what they chose to represent with their art. In bonsai, we have this really neat device where what are we talking about? We're talking about trees. How do we talk about them? We talk about them through trees. Not always trees, sometimes vines, sometimes shrubs, but, and not always are we representing just trees. Sometimes we're representing shrubs. Sometimes we're just, you know, appreciating a flowering plant in a pot. But for most of our purposes, we're talking about trees, the image of trees, and all that means to human beings, and we're using trees as our medium to express our own thoughts about trees to other people. Yes, well, this here, as I said, American Elm, when I was uh, working at the Arboretum before the bonsai came, I was in the nursery operation and working on the grounds and gardens and such. Well, there were no gardens. I was on the grounds and working in the nursery. And we produced many, many native woody plants grown from seed. And some of these became available to me as I was casting about for something to work with, you know, to try to get up to speed, get some practice in. There were these excess plants in the nursery. And I asked, can I use some of them? And they said, sure. And then they got upset when I cut them all up. But <laughs> they were there, 